Well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Ricky Cook, and this is uh, the Hillsong Creative Technology audio webinar. Um, we're going to be hosting one of these a week, and uh, just want to introduce you to my friends who uh, brought along for um, you know the journey. And uh, first of all, uh, you know, ladies first. We'll go with Madeline Wolfley. She's a monitor engineer at Hillsong. She looks after Young and Free and Hillsong Worship, and uh, you know, spends a lot of the time on the road um, touring. Um, she also helps me out locally with conference audio production managing and, and things like that. Um, and she's going to look after the Q&A section and chat, so basically moderate the, um, the webinar today. Um, so next I'm going to introduce Andrew Crawford, a.k.a. The Mix Wizard. Um, Andrew... Uh, Basically, he was on staff for uh, Hillsong the longest time, Hillsong Music Australia, actually. He was um, a mix engineer, project manager for a lot of albums and a producer for a lot of those albums. Um, currently works at the Technical Audio Group and looks after the brand Allen and & Heath. And um, uh, still on team here, mixes all the time, mixes our major conferences, um, couldn't do it without him. And uh, last but definitely not least is uh, Justin Arthur. So... Justin is a uh, basically Why? freelance um, <laughs> legend. Yeah, freelance uh, systems engineer. Um, he looks after a lot of our system designs and our um, loudspeaker uh, designs, so PA designs for conferences and any other external large events. I uh, also um, he helps me out a lot by taking a lot of my plate by running around the country and tuning our PAs and and basically looking after general loudspeaker and amplifier maintenance for us. Um, so, yeah, he's got a long, long history of doing um, – actually, I shouldn't say that because you're technically younger, younger than me, but jazzy has got a big background in um, massive, massive events. So most Olympic ceremonies to date, Jazzy, is there any Olympics yeah, that you haven't done? Uh, there's a couple we haven't done, yeah. Um, there's a couple, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Only a few though. Only a few. <laughs> yeah. But you know, all the you know, all the major ceremonies, com games, uh Asian games, things like that. You know, Josie's been in involved with in one capacity or another. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so basically what we're gonna talk about today is uh we unfortunately uh will not be doing Hillsong Conference this year. So Hillsong Conference 2020 is uh cancelled or postponed, as we're saying. Um does so we're going to do two next year. Yeah, we got, I guess. Yeah. yeah, well, if it's postponed, we're going to have to do two, aren't we? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, basically what we're going to do is uh, what normally around this time, probably a little bit earlier, but we would, have been, we would be starting to talk about Hillsong Conference and, and how we would approach it. We'd start to look at the stage designs and we'd start to navigate all of the creative aspects and work out how we're going to make sure that every seat in that room has great audio. Um, so instead of, because we can't actually do it this year, we figured we'll take everyone along for the journey of, you know, what it would look like if we were to do it. So what we're going to do is go and unfold a lot of the previous Hillsong conferences, uh, colour conferences and other events um, throughout the years and, uh, and generally uh, talk about the challenges we've had, um, the systems we've used and why we've used them, um, our battles with uh, prediction software, um, you know, PA vendors and, and systems engineers and, and everything along the way. Um, of course, feel free to ask any questions. Um, hit up the Q&A or the chat. Um, so uh, Mado will be monitoring that the whole time and, and she'll interrupt us and, and stop us from chatting if we're, uh, you know, just rambling on. Mm. Um, cool. So uh, let's um, – where should we start? Should we start from one of the early ones or should we kick off from one of the newer ones? What do you reckon, from the current. Start something current. Let's look yeah. at last year. Let's unfold last year. Last year. So Jazzy's, uh, Jazzy's the, the master with Vectorworks. And uh, last year would be a blueprint because last year was an Adamson system. Yep. So it was uh, a lot of E15, E12s, S10s, um, E119s. What do you want to look at first, the Vectorworks or the blueprint? Let's look at the Vectorworks. Okay. And, uh, and if there's any renders. And uh, We'll have a quick chat about the challenges that that one last year, because uh, last year was like we had split arrays, and uh, you'll see why. Yes. And, and limited product available. That's yeah, yes, that is that true. Was a yeah, massive challenge. We which had. a massive challenge in its own. Yeah. Yes. 
Uh, just a moment, sorry, it's opening the file. Yeah, so last year we had a design that was in the round. And this is, when we say in the round, fully in the round. Yeah. Um, What's the seating the capacity of Kudos? Uh, yes. Is it like 20, 22,000 or something? It's 22, like for a sporting event in yep. the round, like a basketball, I'm sure it's like 22,000. Yeah. What yep. rings in my head. Yeah. So, yeah, the mode we're in, it's got to be, you know, 20 odd thousand because we put a lot of people on the floor still. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. 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 And I mean, uh, every year ours, is, it's sold out and we're somewhat over the capacity. Year. So, it's, um, it's definitely a lot of fun, especially when you've got, to, uh, you've got these really sort of abstract stages to work with and we have to get coverage all the way down to the, to the floor because um, yeah. the, front, the, rows, the front rows go all the way up to the edge of the stage. And lots of screens. Yes, <laughs> lots, lots of screens. Of screens. And, so it's, that, and it's the same. You've got to be able to see the screen in every seat but also hear the PA in every seat, which is an interesting physical challenge. Yes. Yeah, brings brings us certainly brings a lot of challenges. So basically, the criteria is is that um, we don't want any, even in the nosebleed sections, we don't want any you know anyone to feel like they're in a B grade seat. So uh, what we want to do is uh, make sure every you know everyone who comes and attends one of our conferences has the most amazing experience possible, uh, both visually and audibly. So that means that we are. Really, we are encouraged by um, our creative design department to try not to block the visual elements with PA, but at the same time, we obviously need to make sure that everybody is going to hear the speech. So the dialogue, spoken word is our highest priority, and we want to make sure that we've got every seat covered. Um, so and we've learned along the years that, you know, you can never always rely on front fill and you can never, you know, you certainly want to make sure you're hitting every seat from the floats. Yes. So that's always a, a challenge. Um, also, guys, if you're uh, if you just joined, make sure um, just jump in the chat and uh, let us know where you're from. Um, I want to see uh, roughly, you know, where in the world people are from and where they're uh, attending Germany. I nearly made my coffee. I was going to make my coffee in my Tim Hortons. Melbourne, mic. Philippines. For all the Canadians, but I didn't. It just ended up in a normal mug. <laughs> <laughs> Breezy, you know, Canada. Hello to all of our Canadian friends, you know. Hello from Pilsen, Kiev. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Gold Coast, Poland. That's Cape Town. I'll throw a funny one in here, Ricky, because you just mentioned it. So, so many years ago, the very first time in this arena, and it was an end stage, and we did... It was the first time we attempted the the, the design um, incorporated a much lower stage than we'd ever done. And this is where we got done with the front fill because um, it was pretty standard practice just to put some front fill boxes up from memory. There were some arcs or something like that to cover the first five, six rows. Um, the first night of conference, youth all ran down the front and no one could hear because they all stood in front of the front fill, because um, the front wheel was way too low anyway, but um, I'm pretty sure the stage was only maybe two or three foot high, if that, where we'd always done a traditional concert stage at five or six feet high. Um, and that was our very quick lesson in, you know, the, that where we adopted this process of the, the, the arrays have to hit the front row. There is no option. So the flow and array, we bend mm -hmm. them, as much as we can. So maybe that's oh, yeah. something you can talk to, Juzzy. Yeah, um, we yeah, banana -ing. Definitely. You're very good at banana -ing. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, yeah, definitely, yeah, as Corp said, the front field for us at, at a Hillsong event is it's almost not used until we sit down and preach. Yeah. Um, most of the time, everything's coming from a flown array. Um, mainly due to the stage height and, and what they like to... Um, Yeah, the yeah. stage is like that to design. Yeah, um, I see if you can see this photo here. You can see how low that stage is. It's basically at head height. 
Yep. And if you want to put a front fill in there, it's going to be below the top of the surface. So it's already, it's at neck height of the first person. So yep. basically of, that. Of course, we can't put anything on the stage um, because they want it to be visually as clean as possible. So typically that front fill is installed under the stage, which then puts it roughly about chest height. Uh, yep. So it doesn't actually do anything. Um, only button fill. Yeah, exactly. So Shoot your belly button. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unless yes. until people are sitting down and for speech, that's where it really kicks in. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. With, yeah, with the speech, for me, the, the front fill, I'm just probably jumping on a bit of your you know, thing, Juzzy, but the, the, the front fill is still an important thing because it helps with your imaging. Oh, completely. Bring, bring the reality back of where the person's preaching from. Absolutely. So you want it, but you just can't rely on it. Yeah, definitely. So that's um, so. When we talk about imaging, we're talking about you're seeing a person on the stage. So you want to feel like their voice is coming from the stage. You don't want it to sound like it's coming from a PA that's flown, you know, thirty feet above your head. Um, mm. You don't want to. You don't want your brain to be kind of looking up while your eyes are looking forward because your ears are hearing it coming from above you. So if you're in one of those front rows, we really use that front fill to reinforce the imaging to bring your perspective down and make it sound like it's coming from the stage itself. Um, so when it comes to imaging, like we're, uh, we really, really uh, try and focus around keeping it stereo because uh, if, if anyone's experienced any of our content, any of our music, it's um, with all, especially all the newer stuff with all the tracks and the keys and the synths and everything going on in there. It's really hard to, it's really hard to mix that in mono and, um, and I'm pretty sure if we actually tried to mix it in mono, half the stuff would disappear. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm quite happy to say I don't have the skill to mix that in mono. I'm sorry. Yeah. God, God gave me two ears and I'm happy to use both. That's it. Yeah. So, um, you know, and we've been over the years, we've been through um, battles with uh, rigging problems and um, weight problems and budget problems where we've almost had to sort of fall back to that rough kind of um, – you know, we basically, this arena, we don't attempt it with anything less than eight arrays um, in the round, mm. in the current configuration. We have tried to look at it, to do it in the past with six, to try and save weight, save money, save whatever. Uh, and we just we just know it's going to shoot ourselves in the foot. And I had to make a tough, a tough call uh, last year, I think it was, when we really had to sort of pull back both budget and weight um, because weight was a major concern. And Croft came back and judged me and said, are you kidding me? That's not going to happen. <laughs> That's like, are we actually going to be able to get away with that? And I'm like, no, you're right. Mm. It's going to, we have to put more arrays in. Um, so, yeah. Um, so we went back that, to eight arrays. Um, That's probably we, an important thing to understand, you know, for other people that are on this. We don't always agree, you know, and mm. what, what probably is the strength of working in a team like this is over the years, We've made mistakes, but when you have a team, the other person will call you out. There's been plenty of times where any of us will go, I don't reckon that's the best idea, yeah. you know, and, and sometimes when you're working on your own and you don't have a team, which it, it, it's, it's, it is a real privilege to have a team of real smart people, um, they help pick things up and don't let you go too far down a path where you go, oh, I wish I didn't make that decision. Um, yeah. So that, that's definitely been a strength that we've had now for a number of years. Um, we're, we're, we're willing to speak up. Sometimes it's not the easiest thing to speak up, but it's the best thing for the conference. Yeah, yeah exactly. And at the end of the day, that's what we're really trying to achieve. It's the greatest outcome for the conference and the attendees. Um, so, you know, if that means we have a couple of disagreements leading up to it, so be it. But at the end of the day, it's always going to yield the better result. Um, the last thing we want to do is start dulling things down to the lowest common denominator. Mm. Um, because hmm. when you, and this is, this is a constant battle with conferences, uh, especially Christian conferences around the globe, um, the creative design aspect of it, like there are some people producing some amazing looking stages. Uh, and the last thing that the designers want to see is these columns of black boxes hanging in the stage. No, I want to see um, them. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, so do I. But it's, and, I, you know, we have to have these conversations with them where it's like it's a necessary evil. It's, we have to do that because if we don't, it's going to prioritise. And I, I, um, I remember listening to the MXU podcast with the, the guys from Passion on it. And they went into Mercedes-Benz Arena in Atlanta and um, 
they they said from the from day one we're prioritizing audio here because this venue has not had a good track record with audio and we do not want that we don't want what we don't want our event to be one of the statistics mm-hmm. uh in so i mean they flew a ton of k1 like a yeah. ton and uh and made sure that every seat was nailed and from everything i heard it sounded fantastic um so you know our own our own um james rudder from hillsong united uh, mixed front of house on New Year's Eve there, um, so and he's a he you know he loves a good K one. So there's not um, I, out of all the guys who who were there, I, I didn't hear a bad result on on front of house at all. So should go. Um, so uh, well, there's a okay. So there's a question there. Yeah. How do you go about the design of the PA, deciding on size, elements, coverage, in house or rental company? Okay, well. The last part of that question, in-house or rental company, it'll always be a rental company. Um, we avoid, wherever possible, removing our own equipment and taking it to site. Sometimes we have to, but we avoid it because typically conference will finish on Friday night or Saturday night and we still have church the next day. So we still have to accommodate for that. So we try to pull out, we start try to avoid pulling out our own equipment, um, especially the PA, that's not going to ever happen. No. So it's always going to be a rental company. Um, last few years, we've uh, happy to give a shout out to uh, Eighth Day Sound. Um, so Eighth Day Sound have been providing us with the um, all the Adamson gear, and uh, which we which we're all fans of and we love. Um, prior to that, it was uh, prior to basically Eighth Day sort of setting up shop in Australia and and having inventory of the Adamson. We've used uh, JPJ. Uh, or Jan's Production Services, as they were previously known as, uh, otherwise, aka Claire Global. Um, and they've basically provided our acoustic systems, um, K1, K2, all the way back to VDOSC. Uh, there was even a year with some Vertec. Vertec. Um, <laughs> and there was one year, uh, Jazzy actually flashed a photo of it before, there was one year with uh, Norwest Production supplied. And this was in a smaller arena, like a mini arena. It was, a, a, it was the old Sydney Entertainment Centre before it was bulldozed and uh, turned into the new um, international convention center. But uh, yeah, that was a monster uh, of a, a monster of a Adamson Y axis rig with uh, the T21 flying V of doom. Uh, that thing, you know, there was a need in a creative element to create an earthquake. And uh, so we created an earthquake. Um, <laughs> we did that. There's nothing like 32, 21 inch Kevlar drivers to uh, get, you know, move some air. Um, jump, hey Ricky, I was just going to say I'll jump in on the the so the comment about like the size of the PA. It's for us when you look at it. If you looked at it on a on an SBL level or just a pure sheer volume, you would go. We put way too many speakers in the space. Um, but for us, it's about coverage. There's there's more headroom than we need, um, or most of us need. Um, mm. So some people still find the end, but. It's, it's, and maybe Juzzy, you could talk about this, that to get the coverage we're after, you, you have to put a lot of boxes in because you, the, the further you split angles and all these things with line arrays, the, again, the more you compromise your final outcome. And because speech intelligibility to us is such a criteria, yeah, you've got paramount. to keep all of those angles, you know, in, in their sweet spot. Yeah. I guess, do, do we just talk about the, the process we go through for a conference. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah. So I, I guess for me, usually either Ricky or, or Luke Fairbay will get in touch and say, you know, and they'll send me the designs for the conference. So there's basically a creative concept. They'll send me drawings of, um, yeah, the creative concept for the conference, be that screen, stage, lights, etc., cetera. Um, and then basically look at how I can design the best PA possible for from an audio point of view, while also being uh, sympathetic to the visual aspect. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll basically get the the Vectorworks drawing or the PDF and basically start designing. Well, I'll, I'll take the the creative design and put that into the prediction software before I put any speakers in. I'll make sure I get all the screens in, all the staging. You know, if there's any trusses that are going to be in the way, they can go in as well. Um, and then look at how I can fit around them and basically come back to production and say, 
this is the best outcome I can come up with, but we need to move this screen, we need to move this truss, or we need to move this, you know, stage element or whatever. And then we have that conversation over weeks, sometimes months, um, trying to get the best outcome for all, all of us, really. Mm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So, uh, Juzzy, um, I mean, a couple of questions popped up, um, like, <laughs> why did we call it the flying V? Was there a certain <laughs> shape to it? Uh, and yes. you've got that drawing on your screen? I have. And then we'll, have. we'll, we'll jump back to that. Um. I'll just say quickly as well, just so people understand, because Juzzy and you, both of you guys will, most of the time when if Juzzy says, hey, can I move this truss or move something, everyone's very accommodating. It definitely, you know, everyone straight away goes, okay, cool, let's, let's sort we what, can, what we can do. Um, and it's only then if maybe the lighting guys can't get the lighting shot thereafter, then they'll say, oh, you know, but normally everyone's very good at explaining the why they've put something somewhere. Yeah. That's a fair comment, isn't it, Jazzy? Definitely. It's, it's, it, you definitely have to explain yourself and the reasons why you want, you know, I could just say I need the screen to be because it's in my way. But, yeah. you know, what, why is it in the way or why is this light in my way, you know? Yeah. Um, yep. And that, that continues right until almost doors. Because yeah, if you can, as much as you can plan, you know, I remember one year basically we were setting up and walking around, and I could see a big five k for an L. They're like this big. It was smack bang in the middle of the array on a truss. And I was like, "Hey, uh, JD, do you reckon you need that?" He's like, "Yeah, sweet, no worries." That good. Um, mm-hmm. I love the chain motor bags. Yeah, from the chain motor bags going hang right in front of your uh, HF. Oh, yeah, on yeah. your array. And they go, oh, what, it just go around it, right? And you're like, well, like, it's this much, right? And then by the time it gets to the back of the room, it's like this much, right? But what happens is it's this much close to the PA. So what you've gone and you're going to put an object that's this wide in front of it. So therefore, there's nothing you know, yes. going out the front. So um, this drawing is actually exactly. pretty, this one's pretty close to my heart because this was actually the first year that I personally uh, managed the audio project managed the audio for a Hillsong conference. Um, and is this 2011? 11. 11? Yeah. Okay. Um, 11. And I remember uh, Josie and I were chatting about it because it had, it had a degree of difficulties. Um, you could see, so the, 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 the dark part at the top, the, the dark gray part, that's a, that's essentially a drape. Uh, the blue part is a lead screen. And I kind of said to him, look, we need to cover the arena in a horseshoe shape but I kind of want every seat to have stereo. Um, We had limited product available. We had very limited budget available. We had limited weight available. Um, So we ended up doing basically splitting each zone. It was like almost like we split it into threes um, each side. So each side kind of had its own um, Y18 and Y10 combo. On each side, we had the wide in wide 10 combos on the mains. And then we threw the ones in the corner to take care of the overlap. So people sitting around the corners. So basically people sitting in between each array got a stereo image. So if you split the venue into threes, we got stereo image. The people in the corner were the ones that were going to suffer. Now to cover that overlap, because you've got, uh, when you put a PA in, Josie can talk about this more with the 6 dB down points. You need to be able to create a very smooth transition between the arrays. But because we went from a, what would be a, a left, a right, to a left and a right, we decided to switch those around and add another array in. So you've got your main left, right. The corner arrays were alternate left, right, and then it was alternate left, right from that point onwards. So that way we managed to maintain somewhat of a stereo image, even if it was reversed but it's still a stereo image. There's still separation and space there and, and made everyone's life easier when they're mixing. Um, you know, it still, um, still created that and gave us that image. Now, um, when you, I guess when you go to the, uh, if we go back to the question of why it's called a flying V. Yes. It's, um, that's it. In the middle. In the middle right there, so. <laughs> basically uh, where those subs are positioned is sort of as symmetrically even as possible from the main arrays to keep the time alignment as even as possible. Um, So you're not having to do any crazy uh, 
um, offsets and with delays to try and align, time align the subs to the mains and keep phase, the phase at the crossover point coherent across around the whole room. Well, for as most of the room as possible. So how, and, many, um, T, how many T21s was it? Uh, it was so two hangs of eight. It's two hangs of eight. So it, it's literally above, if, you, if you're not used to looking at speaker drawings, it's above where it says 4.15 metre radius, those two sort of square blocks just above the truss there. Um, yeah. Yeah, there we go. He's got some pretty pictures showing where the, the drivers are now coming, <laughs> those arrows. That's yes. it. Yep. So there's the subs in the middle there. Yeah, there we go. Nice. Yep. Uh, I mean, I wish we had photos. So that's yeah. 16 T21s. And that, yeah. Yeah, that had an awesome amount of punch. Yeah. So they, let's, okay, let's talk about where the negative that this created. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> So you're, if, you're you, best if, if you were standing on school. stage underneath this, <laughs> what kind of lobe did you get? The, this was not the monitor guy's favourite thing. No. No, it wasn't. <laughs> well, only when we yes. positioned the vocalist underneath them. Once we yeah. moved them, it definitely was better. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's also an interesting thing, people, if you don't understand, when you've got a hollow stage, which most of the stages in these kind of venues are, the, the stage can essentially, when you're energising it, can become a big speaker, a big, you know, speaker diaphragm. And, yeah, this this de definitely energised the stage and the whole stage was just vibrated out of control. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we had rust falling out of the roof. <laughs> there was an old venue. It's, uh, no longer is this, but we definitely had rust falling out of the room. Yes. Um. Is there but just... I will say as well, just it was incredibly even. The coverage, the sub in the room, um, it did an excellent job of, yeah. of very even sub. So, yeah. now, and just on that, Jazzy, you want to talk about um, just quickly the point of having uh, a single source of sub uh, and why we create these monster single sub arrays versus distributing the subs around the room, for example, like in the round. Why would we not distribute subs around the room? Um, and there's a question I see there from Nate saying, uh, newer cardioid, I'm assuming you've seen cardioid boxes, any advantage in the rounds? Um, I mean, we'll get to that one after. That kind of made me think about why we, why we build these big monstrous sub arrays rather than, um, you know, going and hanging a sub array behind each main array. Yeah, well, but it's basically all down to the, the interaction between the subs. Um, uh, I should do, while I'm talking, I'll try and do a, a, a thing so we can have an example of it. Um, no. But I don't, go, go, Groff. Uh, while you're talking, Juzzy, I want to yeah. know, do you do steering on those subs or are they all just one big block? No, all one big block, all one one big coherent source is, is what I do. Um, so and basically steer. When, you, when you introduce steering, you sacrifice <clears throat> SPL. Yeah, there is that. And also, typically, the line lengths we see of those is probably not long enough to have any advantage of steering. Um, yeah, basically, you, know, you start adding delay time to subs as you go down to try and steer it down the floor. Um, and the, the benefit you would see from that doesn't outweigh the negative. So you, you would There's lose always a trade-off. There's always a trade-off, no matter what you do. It's always a trade-off. Yeah. Uh, in, in physics, you don't get something for nothing. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm just trying to find something that I can show you. Right. Um, so I was going to say, while he yeah, does yeah, that, Ricky, yeah, I reckon yeah. we could answer... Five tips for a beginner setting up their PA. Exactly. Number one, I was literally just reading that one. Walk around your room. So don't don't just stand in your mix position. So if yep. you're trying to get a handle on your PA system, um, number one, walk walk around your whole room and ensure the boxes cover everywhere they need to cover. Yep. Number two from me would be the the PA should always sound with a vocal mic. You should always be able to, basically with the PA flat, you should be able to talk on into a vocal mic and it should be clearly audible. If the vocal mic sounds muffled, 
then then essentially your EQ on that PA system, you should I I would be suggesting you should modify that. Um, if you don't have someone, if that's beyond your skill set, you always want to find you know your own juzzy, your own person that can come and help you on the journey. Um, I always recommend that churches have a local, you know, partner with a local production company or contractor. It will help you immensely build your church, um, bringing them in. Um, so that's two tips from me. Over to you, Ricky. So I would um, absolutely agree with your, um, especially with the, the vocal mic. Um, so first thing is uh, you, when you're, if you're setting up the system or, you know, it's the first time you're using a system or it's a foreign system to you, uh, make sure the system is balanced. So the system will comprise of multiple components. Um, you want to make sure that your subs to your lows to your mids to your highs are balanced. Um, you don't want anything out of proportion. Now, you don't want not have any um, analysis tools to be able to do that. Uh, that's fine. You can use your ears. Um, put some uh, music, put some content on that you're really familiar with and, uh, and more or less start um, making sure that that system's balanced. Now, if it's in a small environment and you're messing around with it and uh, you're kind of adjusting things at the DSP or if it's even an analog processor, uh, if, it's a, if it's just a crossover, um, you know, you can pull things back by one or two dB, three dB even, and, and you'll be fine. You're not going to affect the, like you are, you know, people will then go on about, oh yes, but you'll be shifting the crossover point and that'll affect phase and this and that. Yep, but if it sounds better, go with it. Uh, you know, you always want to set yourself up for a win. Um, and your ears are always going to be the better judge, uh, despite what an analyzer might tell you. So um, there would be that. Again, reiterating what Croft said, I quite often will grab a 58 or whatever the vocal mic is and I'll walk back to the console and I'll make sure I've got it dialed in with my voice through that microphone. And that I've learned over the years that always yields a better result. Um, you can you can go and set up smart and you can go and uh, pink, you know, run pink noise through the PA and look at a FFT or look at an RTA and tune until your heart's content. Um, and so that might yield you a great result. You might actually be able to pull it off, but at the end of the day, just grab a 58, talk through it, make sure that your your S's are under control, your ch is under, like your sort of your three to 4K byte is under control, um, sometimes as high as 5K. Your wooliness is under control, so you're sort of 250 to anywhere between 250 and 500 region. Um, and, and things like um, the next tip is find the frequencies that excite the room. Uh, you'll find that all, room have, all rooms will have different acoustic properties. And like for us, our like our local auditorium here, our convention center, uh, that 100 hertz triggers it every time. So, uh, sort of 100, 100, and between 100 and 110 will will trigger that room, and it'll hang around for a while, and it just becomes annoying, and it muddies up your mix, and you can't get uh, a good sort of bass to kick relationship happening, and and things like that. So, um, we focus on that, and and we know that that's what happens in our room. Um, Find what find the faults in your own room. So, and you can do that using your own voice with a vocal microphone. You know, you know, do sweeps with your mouth. Do uh, you know, sort of, you know, do the hoo hoo and the ha ha until you find you know in the tss, tss, until you find those frequencies that resonate that room, and just simply notch them out. You know, until you get them under control. Um, and uh, Jazz, you want to take the last one? Um, oh, do you want me to go back to this sub thing? Yeah. We, need, we, we need one more tip, mate. Five tips. Croft did oh. two. I did two. Uh, five tips. Uh, uh, one more tip. Ooh. What's some like when you walk up to a foreign PA, what do you do? And I know you do something that, because I do it too. And say, for example, you have, you have a reference microphone and you mm. have an analysis tool. You have smart. What do you do between the left and the right? Oh, you, you would take your microphone, stick it in the middle and make sure that both the left and the right are performing the same. Um, and if they're not, then you start digging, start investigating what's wrong with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. More often than not, I've done that, stuck the mic in the middle of the room 
took a took a trace of the left and took the trace of the right and somewhere in the mid-range they radically looked different and you're like uh, okay <laughs> yeah. we need to investigate this before i even attempt to do a line check yep exactly yeah, so can't. there's a question we could ask Juzzy. Um, yeah. Are you using audio prediction software or is this just Vectorworks for designing PAs for something like Hillsong Conference? It's, it's a combination of the two. So I'll, I'll get the Vectorworks file from the, the production team um, and then that gives me the chance to have, you know, build elements like the screen and the stage in the prediction software accurately um, you know, with millimetre accuracy. So I... I know exactly where the stage is. I know exactly where the screen's going to be. Um, once I have that, then I can place PA around that within the prediction software. And then going back the other way, once we have a design that we're somewhat happy with, I'll take um, a 3D um, a 3D render basically of the PA and put that back in the Vectorworks and send it back to the production team so they can see sight lines, they can see weight loadings, um, yeah, if there's any obstructions, if we're going to clash with a lighting truss or any video motors, will are we even able to hang it? Is there a, you know, like in, in Kudos Bank Arena, there's um, there are rigging beams in the roof, but there's a, a whole um, fan extraction system that sits on top of them, and you can't access them to actually get a span set on them. So yeah, it's definitely a two-way process, and you definitely use both tools. Yeah, and uh, do you guys have examples of where the software maybe didn't exactly line up with what you thought would happen? Ooh. <laughs> well, that that exact example, you know, that 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 happened to us because we were there looking at the files, looking at the rigging, rigging beams in Vectorworks, and going, "Yeah, sweet, I can get a motor on that beam, and it'll be easy." We walk in the venue, look up, and go, "Oh, you can't actually. The beam is there." But you can't get to it because the you know the the extraction system wasn't on the drawing or you know something like that. Um, yes, and certainly back in like 2011, when we were using things like YX Shooter from Adamson, it was only ever in 2D. It was never in 3D. So every array had to be its own file, and you had to sit there with a bit of paper and a protractor and a pencil and work out which way you were going to point each array so they overlapped properly. And I, I think I was still doing that, that method. I was still doing that for, um, uh, I was trying to remember the first United tour I went out as the front house systems engineer. I was still doing that even with um, Sound Vision. Because mm -hmm. um, while Sound Vision worked in 3D then and it was pretty new to running like, uh, you know, it was pretty early software for the current version that is with, with that could model in 3D and had the, all the venue libraries and everything available. Um, I would use Sound Vision to mainly predict the vertical plane, but I would still do the horizontal plane manually uh, because Sound Vision told me the boxes could do one thing and it would react one way. Uh, my gut instinct told me the boxes could do something else or would do something else in the horizontal plane, especially when it came to making your um, the interaction between your mains and your sides. Uh, because on that tour, I think we we're running K1 and I think the side hangs were like Kudo. Was it Back then memory? it would have been Kudo, yeah. Yeah. Crudo. Crudo, yeah. Oops. <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, it was needed to get loud. So, uh, yeah, so you, you're, back then it was like the prediction software was like, you know, it was early days and that was good. It was a great tool and it was early days, but you still had to do, there was chunks of it you would still kind of look at it and go, mm, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. In, in, those, we all, in those days, you had to overshoot, you know, if you, for the back rows. Yeah. And like, yeah, I know it's not going to do that, you know. Yeah. I, I still do. Even even today, like with the prediction software now, I'll, I'll still point the first or the second box over the back row. Yeah. Because it, it still tapers off at the very top of things. Yeah, yeah but, you know things like in in Kudos Bank Arena, the the back wall, wall even though it is um, like corrugated sheet metal, it's yeah. also perforated and there is an absorber behind it, so you can get away with shooting that up there and just getting that SPL to the back row, the same, mm -hmm. the same experience for that last person. Yep. 
Yeah. Um, so, guys, in the chat, feel free to, um, you know, uh, it don't have to be questions. Feel free to throw comments out there. Um, you know, are you guys getting a lot out of this? Is this is this good? Um, we kind of uh, we kind of left this open ended. We didn't really want to nail down the topics because we kind of wanted to let it naturally flow. Because this, the, what the conversation we have now is the conversations we would have leading up to a conference. Um, you know about about like how far do we overshoot and how much of PA do we use and, and how we're going to design the sub array and things like that. So, you know, uh, make sure you go and drop the comments in, make sure you're, you know, please ask the questions. Um, we're more than happy to answer them. Um, but Jazzy, you were going to show us. Yes. So this was, this is, um, let me share it again. Hey, while yeah. you're sharing Jazzy, yeah. because I think this is interesting and hopefully it's in this info and for in, in this info anyway, Hmm. What what what's the sweet spot in the arena? What's the sweet spot trim for the bottom box that you never want to go over for this type of event? Because oh. I wouldn't say there's a number. Um, it it would all depend on. There's so many factors, but essentially, but you know, you're not going to want the bottom box at thirty meters. I know. No, <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> um, a lot of it to do is with the the low mid information. Um, yep. So you know, uh, can you still see me as well as? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if if you've got a line array like this, no matter how much you bend that bottom element down, because it's a line, you, the LF won't actually bend. It'll yeah. still yep. keep going straight. So yeah. the higher you lift that up, all these people yeah. down here underneath it, down the front, that low mid gets thinner and thinner and thinner, and then just becomes not pleasant to listen to anymore um, yeah and, and and the longer your line array like the longer your line source is or your line array but you know going back to basics like line source theory is the longer your line is the more control you actually have now you might not want that control but you're going to get it whether you like it or not so mm -hmm. the longer your array is the more your vertical gets controlled so if you're talking about creating this big long line array you are effectively going to end up steering your low and your low mid energy uh, to, to the length that that's capable of controlling and directing it one way. And that's the way that the bulk of the array is pointing. So you might have boxes pointing down, but bulk of your low end energy, you're only, only the, mid, the, the upper of the mids and the HF will go down. The mm. bulk of the low end energy is going to fire forward. forward. So you need to compensate exactly. and, and, and or, or think about that in your design. Yeah, exactly. So going back to the subs, so basically this was last year and we had four hangs of, was it nine? I think we ended up doing nine deep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. E119's in the centre here. Um, and then if I zoom out, can you see my mouse? Yeah, yeah. As well? yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is the venue here. And if I just do a quick... Um, so were these in any here. kind of cardiac jazzy? No, no cardio at all. No, no cardiac. All just, just... All just on. So you can see there that... That's the SBL coverage around the whole venue of uh, we're at 80 hertz, right? Um, this These side bits are a bit hotter, but that's just because we're closer, physically closer than the ends of the here. Um, so that's in the centre there, all as one group. Now, I think the question was what happens if you put the subs out near the arrays? So if we take these subs and move them out here, yeah. Real time. That's it. So you can see now there's a sub here, 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 and here. There's four subs out behind the arrays. Yep. And then if we plot that this is be in the SPL with interaction, this is what you are. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It's a pretty yeah. picture. And honestly, and, you hear that at like some shows, like oh, you know, yeah. you're walking from your you're walking from the, the door to your seat and uh, you hear that in the background music. Yeah. And this is the this is one of the conversations that came up last year when we when we realised basically that the whole production I think I can't remember the number it was like twenty tons over on yep. the roof we had to we had to cut big time yep. lights audio we all everyone had to cut stuff um, so and also the thing that contributes to that um, is the further you put stuff in the centre the more load becomes in the centre of the roof and it wants to collapse so if you can move the weight out it'll help the roof yeah. so there was discussions around moving the subs out behind the the main arrays or maybe even putting them in between the main arrays here but i just basically sent back this saying 
we can do that. It's possible, but this is the end result. You can see. Exactly, yeah. that's what happened. I and, think and you stood your ground because I was trying to be the nice. I thought this was the time where I tried to be the nice boy, <laughs> but I was going, oh, come on, we could do something. And you were like, no. Yeah. <laughs> we can see it right there. It's 109 dB. Then yeah. we go down to like 88 dB at 8 yeah. minutes. Yeah. So the that, experience for those people, the, the different people there, oh, and, and, and that's not massively different. The, the actual energy, like the air movement is still there, but the point is that that's cancellation. So that's mm. interaction between two subarrays, right? So mm. that has a detrimental experience to the low end of the main arrays as well, um, yeah. right? Because that extends all the way up to beyond the crossover point. So you're, you're going to end up killing your, your low end of your main array um, in, in, you know, various forms as well. So, uh, yeah, that just has disaster written all over it. Um, mm. it's the same as when people do um, in the round and it's kind of more of an oval shape and they'll put two subarrays at the very end. Mm. Uh, you'll get any energy firing backwards from each sub will cancel out other energy at each end. And then what happens in the middle at the sides, you'll get this like 6 dB increase from both arrays uh, and it's overwhelming. And um, so, yeah, that's also, uh, I've seen that before and it's ugly. And uh, you can go, you can talk about cardioid until the cows come home in an arena. It's not like an arena of this size. It's not going to matter that much. Um, and the other thing you need to look out for is the reflection off the walls coming back as well, because you've got to basically account for those. So why don't we just put all the subs on the ground and get ground loading and just like a big rock concert? It will fall over. <laughs> yeah, and the drum kit will vibrate off the stage, and the guys up in the the guys up in the very you know in the nosebleed section just be like, "Where's the low end? Mm, is it on?" Some. Yeah, mm. people. So the people in the front row get impaled. So yeah, again, that's something. These are some things that we learn. I'm, I'm throwing that one out there, being a little bit funny about it, but you know, when we started, um, you know, these were things that was just common practice. You know, mm. for it was you know. Essentially, people treated us like, you know, oh, you're just a rock concert. We throw a PA in. We put a whole bunch of subs on the ground. And it just didn't work for us. Um, yeah. So we definitely, and, you know, hey, people laughed at us. People definitely went, you guys are idiots, you know, <laughs> when we started doing these big flowing sub arrays and things like that um, to a certain extent. And now people have stopped and gone, oh, oh that, that's actually quite smart. You get a much better result. Um the rental company uh, system techs, the guys who come out and fly the PA who are kind of like, you know, sort of kind of used to doing rock shows. So they just go and flow, you know, fly your, your left and right arrays and, and go and stack a bunch of subs on the ground. I mean, it's way more common these days. It's, way, it's been common for like the last quite a few years to go and fly your subs as yeah. part of your main arrays. Um, you know, that's definitely become a trend over the last sort of five years, um, if not earlier. But uh yeah, a lot of the guys who are the rock and roll guys who are used to coming out and rigging the PAs for us are kind of, got, you know, and, and you find this when you're, uh, you know, just you'll go in in the morning and start making sure that the rigging plot is getting marked out on the floor as per it is on the drawing. And uh, a lot of the time the rigger will walk up and just sort of look at the, he'll move his laser over and look at the beam above and go, oh, if I shift that by a foot, uh, you know, I'll be able to do a dead hang. <laughs> and that's where Josie will walk up and shift it back by a foot and go, no, no. <laughs> No, no, no. One, you know, one or two degrees here is a lot over there. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, we're really, really, really particular. And, uh, and we've worked with our contractors, we've worked with our suppliers. Um, they're, they've gotten used to us. A lot of, a lot of them have actually taken the, the OCD ness of what we try to achieve and they've taken it back and applied it to their own, uh, to their other shows that they do. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty encouraging. But, um, it's definitely you don't want to feel like you're being beaten up by your suppliers or by your uh, contractors or your riggers or anything like that. It's worth if if you feel that it's right and and that hey I want to do it this way because of the reasons and you know whatever the reasons are and you know that that's going to have an impact down the road. And I mean I made the mistake of uh, quite a few years ago on a on a hill song. It was an album record, I think it was, um, of being sort of letting the letting the the PA company get away with not meeting the spec exactly, 
and it, it bit me big time, right? And well, it didn't bite me, it bit everybody big time. Um, we had a lot of holes, a lot of gaps we had to fill, and I've never let that happen again. Hmm. That was, that's potentially a prediction software thing too. That was that was all in that learning era of, you know, what you know it says one thing, but you know, well that yeah, was the the, the, um, louvers, the louvers don't do what they say. No, it was the DV when the DV <laughs> dosks came down, and yeah. it looked okay. But yeah. then when you went and sat in that section, there's like this triangle that was not covered. Uh, uh, You're like, oh, that's fine. We'll put front fill in. It's like yeah. Yeah, going back to like that's great until someone stands up. Yeah. 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 It yeah. only takes one person and they're blocked they're the blocked front foot. So. Yeah. 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 Um, so they, uh, can we kind of take this topic about, you know, we're talking about flow and subs and floor subs and someone's also asked about that. So is it more of like a style thing as in rock versus church style or does it have to do with the venue primarily or what do you find is one of the biggest contributors? Uh, I don't know if, um, I mean, if you know Hillsong, it's like, it's a rock show. Um, hmm. Or if you've been to any Hillsong events, it's um, especially so Hillsong conference. We take corporate AV and rock touring and smash them together. Sorry, see my mic. Um, you know, so it's big PA's that can go loud that cover the whole room. Lots of bottom end, um, big band, lots of inputs. Uh, you know, pulling a big sound, but with the finesse of a high end corporate AV event. You know, um, so we want the spoken word to sound supernatural and be really well received in every seat. So it's not so much a stylistic thing. It's a, it, it's a necessity, I would say. It, it's a criteria. Um, that, the reality is it's a criteria we've put on ourselves to, to achieve a certain level. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a touring show, they bump in, you know, it, it, it's a one-day show, they bump in, they bump out. You know, we look at, especially for conference, um, it, we're there for a week. Um, yeah. And we want... And, and this was the thing. We always, we would do conference and it's like, and literally, and like Juzzy's picture there, we had we, we had subs that caused cancellations and we're there going, oh, like this seat's awesome, this seat sucks, this seat's awesome. This So this whole journey has been about consistency across the room um, from, from, you know, 20 hertz to 20K. Um, I'll, I'll throw a fun one in because this whole journey of where we added in, we put delays in. We don't need delays. If you're just doing a rock show, you, you don't need them. But I used, I used to be standing at the mixing desk and I'd look up into the balconies and you could see everyone during the preaching le- leaning forward because they, they're trying to hear because you've got even the ambient SBL, people r- rustling their papers. Once you're that far back... You know, the, the reality is this, this, the sound pressure is dropping off. You can still hear, but it's not in your face. The, the preaching you, you, is not right there. You um, couple that with the venue acoustics yeah. and you're hearing verb. Mm. And you're hearing, yeah, verb. So, yeah, so we, again, went down this path. We, you know, we basically always end up putting some element of delays in um, because we've got this criteria where we want we want the experience of, it doesn't matter if you're in the front row or the back, you have the same experience um, at the conference, you know? Yeah. So, yep. yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. And the video guys started putting delay, uh, like delay, well, they start off with delay projection screens and then they moved to delay LED screens. And then yep. obviously that goes in shadows, our PA. So therefore we have to put delays in now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but, and there's, so. it's the same criteria for them. Yeah. They're doing it. So if you're up the back, you're not missing out. You're not, it's That's not it. like there's a preacher down there. You because you know, especially when someone's presenting, mm. being able to see their facial expressions and all of that adds, you know. Um, oh yeah, it's that connection, the emotion of it, and yeah, and the in the connection. That's the the better word. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's um big one. Um, I mean, we're getting we're getting pretty close to to uh, running out of time. We've only got about six minutes left. So, um, Matto, if you want to run through and and, and hit up any uh, last minute questions, and I will just uh, chuck a random one out there because it get I get asked a lot about it. Uh, Adamson themselves get asked a lot about it. Uh, the picture keeps popping up on Instagram every now and then. Um, you know, PA of the day and things like that. Jazzy, show us the thirty two wall of E one one nines and what the prediction of that looks like. <laughs> oh yes, and why we did it. Um, well, that particular one comes back from when I used to, when we used to use um, 
JPS or JPJ, um, and we're using the two one eights in the center. The SB218s, um, yeah. SB218s, yeah. yeah. And basically, again, it's all about that one source, um, that one subsource, and uh, the least amount of interactions possible. So I do have the prediction for that here. Well, we even uh, did it with EA, um, SB1000. That's right, the old EAW oh, SB1000. Yes. Yep. I remember that. Yes. Yep. Uh, three um, wide, eight deep, I think it was. Uh, 24 of those guys, but yeah. we went to like, when we went to 32. So it was like four wide eight deep of E119s. Because if you look at the horsepower of an E119 versus most boxes twice its size, it still outdoes them. So yeah, yeah. it's a pretty it's, impressive little cabinet. You can see here that's the that's the prediction of that's the, the four wide there. And then if we do we got this. So again, this is the the one source. Now, the interesting thing I had here, so when we were using the, the double 18 subs, I had a center, center one eight deep and then two sort of on an angle like this, which gave a slightly better SPL over here. Um, but because these are single 19s, you have to button them all together. You don't get that steering with them. Um, but as you can see here, like it's pretty even coverage yeah. almost everywhere. It's a little quiet over here, but yeah, I, I don't think that's touching. It wasn't touching an issue. It's actually. But you're talking like 101, um, yeah. you know, and if we move out further to the darker green section and the, you know, it's not. It's not. These are all one DV steps, you know. Yeah. Oh, so, we've got yeah. a, I just have to do a quick shout out. We've got a celebrity in our mates, mate. Pooch, we? welcome. Hey, Pooch. <laughs> yeah, so. so Sorry, know, we have about. another question. Yeah. Um, the difference between approaching a Hillsong conference and maybe something like a United tour or, you know, one of the Hillsong bands tours um, and the difference between prioritization of like spoken word or just music. What is the difference? Well, for me, a tour, the United stuff still has the same criteria. If we had James yeah. on here or Pippert. They, again, they very much, you know, Ricky went out for a number, you know, a couple of years in a row as the systems tech to, to get their PA where we wanted it because the yeah. guys that were doing the tour just didn't understand our criteria. They, they were lovely dudes. They knew how to put the PA up, but just, you know, it's that extra 10% that we were after. Mm. That's it. And the other thing too is with our bands, because it's like a, a four or five piece rock band uh, with one, two, three vocals, it's a lot easier to, I'm not going to say it's a lot easier to mix because that's, you know, that's not fair, but it, our no, shows it is. are like, it is. it is. Okay. It is. <laughs> um, it is, uh, you know, and, and the thing, and, and, and talking about Pooch going back to, so the, the, uh, the webinar that he done with Chris Raybob where they talk about the third guitar, like that was awesome. <laughs> it was so good because it, uh, well, I mean, I could relate to it because we deal with it a lot. And with United, it's like, try four. Yeah. Try four on yeah. the guitars. What do you do with that, you know? Um, and, and I think uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks, I want to see if, uh, if James is available and get him on and um, talk about some of those challenges that uh, we face. But, um, but yeah, uh, with us, our stuff, it's like um, there is a, like, it's, the input count is, can be out of control. Um, and, the, you know, the guys are so creative. They're coming up with new stuff all the time. But what we've found is like um, with a lot of the traditional and the early line source systems, they had uh, the mains were doing all the work and the subs were added as a, a low end extension or an effect. Um, and a lot of guys back then were driving subs off boxes and doing crazy stuff like that. And, and that, that's cool that if it worked for you, that's great. But we have eight vocals on stage. So that's eight mics that are all open. We have a large drum kit. The drum kit's got pads and electronic components to it and everything like that. Um, I mean, it's not like, it's not uh, Pooch's Iron Maiden kit with nine toms, but it's <laughs> it's pretty crazy. And uh, and then you've got, you know, um, on one United tour, uh, one of the guys was also playing like an array of toms and percussion as well um, as part of the openers and various things like that. Um, so it's a, uh, 
you know, and, and you've got to get all of that. You, you, like people expect they're there. They want to hear it. They, they can see it. They want to hear it. So you've got to get that all into the PA. And what was happening was we were finding that we were finding the end of those 15 inch drivers. Uh, and the bottom end was, it was hard to get it to sound clear. So there was a PA that, you know, it's very popular to this day. Uh, I'm not going to talk about makes and models, but I would jump and it wasn't processed by Lake, but I would jump in with a DLP and I would high pass the thing. And that that's, I was viewed as a criminal to the, to the rental company. They were like, how dare you high pass that main array up at 80 Hertz. That is sacrilege. But the thing is there was a sub array right behind it that had that happened to have the same low end drivers as the main array. We crossed them over. We had twice as many low end drivers and we basically, we split the load so the bottom end of the PA wasn't having to carry like, or wasn't have to carry the weight of what we was trying to be mixed um, and trying to get that clarity in the definition. So we basically split it between the main array and the uh, existing low end extension array. And that basically cleared it up. You could get definition out of the kick. You could get definition out of the bass. The bottom end of the toms were clear and the vocals stopped sounding muddy. So it, well, it was a, you know, it was that was a learning experience as well. Um, I'm actually gonna um, let's see. I mean, this is a curveball because I have never done this before. But here, I I added. Um, uh, Pooch as a panelist. Pooch as a panelist. So there we go. Whoa! Look at that. <laughs> Welcome live from the USA. Hey man, live from the USA. How are you guys? Good, mate. You good. good, man. How are you? Awesome. I was just uh, like kicking myself because I got the timing wrong and uh, am catching you just at the end. So I didn't get to see all your good stuff. I, wow. I thought it was 8 p.m. my time. And so uh, That's right. we're going to be doing it every week. So uh, <laughs> cool. Know, expect, expect me to hit you up in a couple of weeks as a guest. So, Oh, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Of course. Hey, it's going to happen. We've all been loving your material. And, yeah. but as oh, said, thank that, you. When you guys were talking about your challenges with too many inputs and and you know the musical challenges that hit, that 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 hit home for all of us very much. Mm. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I've been watching your stuff too. It's really good, man. I dig it. It's Having fun a bit of fun, you know. Yeah. Hey, I've got uh, one random with with this group of people. Has anyone unpacked their tour bag yet? <laughs> I'm not lying. Mine's still sitting next to the bedroom. My wife keeps looking at me strange. It's- of course, mine's still in. Mine's in my closet. Uh, you know, you have double everything, right? The stuff that's in their tour bag is not what you use at home. So, no. of course, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I figure I'll unpack mine sometime around October. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, I mean, so for everybody that's uh, that's joined our webinar um i mean for those that don't know and i'm i'm pretty sure it'll be not many at all um so pooch so ken van druten he is the front of house engineer currently for iron maiden uh previously uh justin bieber uh which is basically majority stadium tours and that that was a you know an awesome show before that uh what like 10 years with lincoln park uh, twelve years of Lincoln Park. Yeah. Yep, and ba- and that's where Juzzy and I both met him. Um, yeah, so mm-hmm. at different stages. I I was out rigging a Wyatt in rig, and then Juzzy was out uh, rigging some Adamson. Um, yep. After I'd finished up with No West, and yeah, um, so and then and, and, uh, you know, and we've kind of uh, we've all stayed friends ever since. It's been awesome. So. It's amazing, man. All you guys down there, um, you know, I've run into some of the best people that you keep yourself surrounded with, you know, Ewan and, uh, you know, you guys are, are amazing down there. It's been, uh, it was, I always had a great time when I went down there with Lincoln Park for sure. Oh, thanks, man. That's yeah, been good. So um, yeah. make sure you're, uh, so jump on YouTube and um, on Instagram, check out uh, Pooch's material. Um, so uh, just do a search for uh, FLH pooch and you, it'll come up um same deal with uh youtube he's also got uh another session just give us a bit a quick chat on um wrong end of the snake so wrong end of the snake is a thing between me and kevin tater mccarthy who is a uh, an amazing monitor engineer um and we've kind of we're like an old married couple uh we've been uh, together for 18 years and we've done, um, over 10 bands, um, major acts together. Um, and so we're, 
we're kind of doing this webinar that's an exploration of like what relationships are in this business and and um, and how that is and and so we're having guests on and um, we definitely uh, would love you to come on there, Ricky. Um, and uh, uh, it's it's you know um, it's been a lot of fun. We had Jesse Adamson on this week, so uh, it was oh, cool. That was, that was classic. Yeah, we actually have uh, Mike Shinoda, a band member from Lincoln Park, will be on there uh, the following week. So awesome. <laughs> Good times. I'll be I'll be watching that one. I'm a I'm a Lincoln Park <laughs> fan from way back. And so when I got the opportunity to do that quick run around Australia with them, that was like well, that was a life changing moment for me. So <laughs> it um, was fun, in more man. ways than one. Uh definitely. Yeah. So, um so yeah, so um, definitely go and look up that content. Guys, we're going to be doing this every week for at least the next, uh, so this is the first one. Um, I've basically signed the guys up for uh, the next se- uh, seven weeks after this. So we decided to do eight weeks and, and see how it goes. Um, <laughs> well, you yeah, have the time. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's, it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's the webinar season. So, you know, um, I mean, we're in the middle of, well, not in the middle, hopefully we're leading towards the end of the last half of the pandemic. Uh, hopefully nothing else fires up after this. It's, it's been pretty devastating what's going on, especially to our industry. Um, yeah. But uh, you kind of, if you have to look at the brighter side, it's, it's opened up a lot of this sort of stuff. Uh, you know, guys getting on YouTube who would never normally do that sort of thing. Um, and I know everyone's been loving the content that's been going out there. Um, you know, so it, it you know, there, there's, yeah, like I said, if we just, if we just focus on the positives, it's actually been an amazing experience. Um, we'll forget that most of the industry is out of work and, you know, and we're, especially for like, you know, I'll personally be praying for those guys, but that's, uh, you know, and, and, and always keeping them in our thoughts and stuff. So uh, if you are actually from a church and you're still actively doing stuff and you need uh, support, especially in audio, make sure you're looking up your local audio guys and reaching out to them. Um, you know, uh, talk to your local, uh, you know, even if it's your, your local union body or, uh, or your local rental house or, or even the freelance engineers that are out there, you know, there's guys that will definitely, they've got time and they're going to be available to help you. So, uh, you know, and, and, uh, it, you know, this age, you're going you're to get guys that would never normally be available or you would never normally get, you know, time from uh, because they'd be so busy. Uh, I'm sure they're, they're going to have time these days. So, um, yeah, definitely reach out to them. And um, and if you can, uh, you know, uh, throw them some work or, 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 you know, get them in as a consultant or even if it's a mix consultant or you're getting them to listen to your mixes and, and give back feedback and advice, then, you know, anything, anything helps. So cool. Uh, guys, so uh, make sure you check out HS Creative Technology on Instagram. That's uh, Hillsong's Creative Technology account. Um, for If you're curious about the, the name Creative Technology, that's the name of our production department. Um, so we kind of moved away from it, wanted to modernize it a bit, give it a bit of a new branding. Um, so check that out. Um, there's a lot of content on there. There's uh, stuff coming out every week. Uh, so obviously we'll be here every week. Um, there's stories about... Um, you know, guys from Hillsong who were doing various things. The last one was from, um, uh, you know, Brad Susan and then before that, oh, Stephen Pippett actually, who's actually the production manager for United. So he talks a lot about United and touring. Um, yeah, so look forward to it. Uh, again, so jump on Instagram, uh, go to our page, feel free to leave comments of what you guys want to hear about. Um, Croft, what have we got coming up? We're going to talk about. I want you to talk like digital transport and how, yep. again, why we, it's, became, it's important yep. for us to have all the consoles on one network, the sources, you know, if, the, if, if it's there, it's there, you know, if you don't mm. have it, you've patched it wrong. Yeah. Um, that's it. <laughs> but, but, but managing that large channel count, but the importance we've learned of having like a single digital transport uh, for these kind of events was, I think, what we we're going to try and tackle next. Yep. Take on next week, yeah. yeah. Uh, if you've got any questions regarding uh, our crazy PA designs and why we do that, feel free to post the questions and we'll do a follow-up, um, yeah. even if it's just on IG, IG or IGTV. Uh, but, yeah, so thanks for coming, guys. It's been roughly – it's been awesome. It's been around, what, 48 attendees, 50 at some spots. So good turnout. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty happy. Um, thanks for joining us, Pooch. 
Yeah. yeah thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, country. Yeah, you're awesome. I'll be, uh, don't, I'll be watching every week. So and, yeah. Um, awesome. And uh, Meadow, any last questions before we. Uh, well, so, let's end on a fun one. We could just talk about our favorite PA sound checking songs. Uh, <laughs> all right. Guest goes first. <laughs> I don't have any. I use virtual playback. You know, that's, that's true. true. That's you true. use your gig. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. But I mean, you know, listen, I, I, for years, I used like Tears for Fears, um, you know, records that were specific to certain parts of the PA. You know, I would use different songs that had sub information in them, mm -hmm. other songs that had mid range information in them. Um, but yeah, I, I did. Um, I did use uh, Tears for Fears for a long time. I can't remember. I don't know. I can't remember the ones that I was using. But yeah, mo uh, for, for now, I totally use virtual playback. That's all I use. The first time I ever heard you fire up a track was uh, Tom Sawyer. Oh, right. I did use that. Yeah. Yep. Um, but uh, you guys, you, got, you and uh, Chris Raybold actually talked about that on your, uh, on your series. So guys, yes. go back and check that out um, where they discuss system engineering and, and PAs especially, you know, out in the big bad touring world. So, um, Croft? Whatever Juzzy's playing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't go anywhere without Juzzy. We know this. <laughs> I'm dangerous without a, without a systems deck. No, a good old Jeff Buckley and, and a mic. Yeah. For me, that, that talking the mic, if the mic, if I've got clarity, yeah, man. I'm good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Juzzy, your extensive playlist? <laughs> I've got a couple. Um, the Jennifer Warns. Um, All right. What else? Um, Come on, you've been using Jeff Buckley forever as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, Jeff Buckley. Yeah. yeah. Um, Everybody here wants you for oh, else that um, uh, oh, I will some remember Dire from Toto. Well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Toto, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, we've, uh, Josie and I especially, like we just trade <laughs> playlists. So. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. I think the legacy of that Jennifer Warren, I mean, I don't know if you came, but. <laughs> I think that legacy comes from Ben from Adamson because he was like the first dude to start playing that a lot in Adamson yeah. demos. So it's funny whenever I talk to people that use Adamson a lot, a lot of them use that track. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Hmm. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll definitely be back next week. And um, we will – uh, we will post on Instagram um, where you'll be able to view this. So this is all recorded and it'll be uh, played back. Um, Matter is that going to be YouTube or? Yeah, IGTV? we'll see about getting that on YouTube. Excellent. Cool. So we'll put Sweet. on the HS Creative Technology account on YouTube and uh, that'll be up in a couple of days. So uh, thanks for coming, guys. Feel free to jump in on Instagram, leave your comments. Um, you know, make sure you sort of giving us feedback, telling us what you want us to talk about, especially in uh, our circle uh, with like, you know, uh, conferences for church conferences. Obviously, not everybody does the size of what we do and what Passion does and those guys. But um, we also like we run many small conferences throughout the year. So we cover the whole variety. So, you know, just tell us what you want to want to hear about. And, and we're more than happy to discuss it. Cool. All right. Ready? All right. Thanks, Jazzy. Thanks, Croft. Thanks, no Rich. No. Especially thanks to Maddo. Yes. See you. Yes. See ya. Bye. Bye.